there we go. So I'm Brian Whipker. I'm the Floriculture Extension Specialist here at NC State University. And today we're gonna to talk about alkalinity. And, and the really the focus that we're trying to look at here is the water alkalinity and not water pH. And, and that's a very difficult concept sometimes to get across. Um, and, and I know that I, I did some travel this past fall and I asked some of the growers um, on this trip, you know, what's your alkalinity? And the, and the term pH came back to me. Well, my water pH is 7.3. Well, that, that's part of the story. And I want to say that's 10% of the story. It's really, it's about the alkalinity. And, and based on that trip back in October, that pretty well made me decide that I wanted to give a presentation on alkalinity. And so for some of you that might have seen some presentations we've done at Cultivate over the years, uh, there are some things that are very similar, but it's always a good review to look at alkalinity and for what goes on with the greenhouse because it's a very important uh, aspect, especially if you have high alkalinity, uh, to know what's there and then how to manage it. So, first of all, I want to thank our sponsor for this, Old Castle. They're a very good sponsor of us at NC State, uh, supplying the substrate that we use for most of the research. So, I wanted to acknowledge them uh, for their ongoing support here at NC State University. So to get started, when we look at pH, and then what we're talking here, pH, the substrate, when things are going well, like that plant in the center, things are nice and green. If the pH goes too low, like the plant there on the left, you start seeing that lower leaf bronzing, discoloration, and, and that plant's not happy. And likewise, if, if on many species, if the pH gets too high, you have a tie up of iron, and then what do you get on the upper foliage? You get that intervenal chlorosis, so yellowing between the veins. And in that case right there, that's a pretty severe case. I really like that photograph. That's that's from uh, uh, one of my trips home to Indiana. It was it was outstanding. So when we look at the pH, and, and we're talking here the pH of the soil, the substrate, the reason why it's a concern is that pH affects the availability of nutrients. And if you get like you know the the Goldilocks, is it too hot, is it too cold, is it just right? We try to get in that just right zone, and that does vary a little by, by plant type, so we have to make some adjustments, but that's th this graphic here shows that. So over a wide pH range, and, and we're always in floriculture between four and eight, we better be at least, you know, nitrogen's pretty well set, it's, uh, potassium's pretty well available, but phosphorus decreases in availability when you start getting above seven. But usually, that's not a concern for us, and that's because we're, we're running lower than that, and we usually add sufficient phosphorus anyway. Then the other group, calcium and magnesium, they're more widely available at higher pHs and they're less available at low pHs, like at four to the left. So, and, and the, you know, just a question of, you know, part of the reason why phosphorus is availability goes down as the pH goes up, that's because it gets associated with calcium, it gets tied up, it's, it's part of what's, what's occurring there. So then the, probably the more important elements that we really target because they're micro elements and they're less, less quantity in the system, it's not that they're less important, but less quantity, you can see all the pink ones. So what's happening with all these micronutrients? There's a wider bar at the, the left, and there's a smaller size bar at the right. So, so these micronutrients are more readily available at low pHs, and in some cases, if you get start getting down below five, it might be toxic, and they get tied up at high pHs. And really the biggest one we see at high pHs being a problem is iron, and at low pHs, it's iron and manganese toxicity. So based on that, we come up with trying to get that, that golden zone of an optimal pH range. And so that does vary by plants. For the most part, 5-4, the 6-4 is our, our real wide range, but there's a number of plants that want it slightly higher, and there's some other plants that want it slightly lower. But that gives you a general 
place where we need to go. If you get below that range, you start getting toxicity problems, and you can see iron and manganese is very available. And above that range, especially iron, in some cases boron, is unav unavailable to that plant. And that's, again, why we try to target this type of a situation. So when we look at alkalinity and what effect it has on pH, the reason for that is think of it in a very simplistic term or way. It's like dissolved limestone in your water supply. So if you're adding limestone water to the plant, what's going to happen? The pH is going to go up. And so if you have adequate levels of alkalinity, the pH is going to be stable. Your plant's going to be good. If the levels are too low, because there are many places, especially in the southeast when we're not over limestone bedrock, that we don't have enough alkalinity and we can have the pH drop, as you can see that plant on the left. Likewise, if the levels of alkalinity are too high, it changes that substrate pH because there again, you have that dissolved limestone in that water and your pH levels increase. So what we're going to look at briefly is low alkalinity water first and then the effects of high alkalinity water. So we cover both ends of the spectrum for what's going on. So when we're looking at low alkalinity, under these conditions, you have none of that dissolved limestone in your water. So the water is pure. So think about that. Then that means there's no resistance to change in that water. There's nothing to offset. If you add something else to the system, there's nothing there to offset it. So it's going to go back and forth a lot. And that happens with surface water, that happens from, from granite or groundwater from granite, sandstone, or shell bedrock. And in, 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 in the surface water includes rainwater. Therefore, under the system, and we run into this in, in areas like North Carolina, except for at the coast, uh, but other areas, that the fertilizer type, if you pick an acidic or basic one, that's going to make your pH go up and down in the substrate. So you have to really watch that. And what we really want to avoid really is a low pH drop. That's more catastrophic and harder to fix, and it takes more time to fix than if the pH went up. So that's something to consider. Uh, that, that's what we have to consider in North Carolina. Now, coming out of the Midwest, I, I'm fully aware of what goes on with high alkalinity water. So, but this is what we're facing down here in the southeastern U.S. So if things go wrong, you can start seeing the plant there on the left, and you can see the slight speckling. This is lower leaves, not upper leaves. And then you can see the progression of getting more yellowing, bronzing going on, and then blackening. These are signs of an iron manganese toxicity. Those plants are taking up excess amounts. Remember that chart we had a few slides back? It's so readily available, it's taken up, and it gets the levels that you start seeing that leaf on the right where the plant tissue turns black. It's dead because it's so, such a toxic condition. So that's what we're trying to avoid under those conditions. Here's a, a, a graphic that Josh did last year after we did a grower visit and we ran into zonal geraniums and we had this bronzing. And you can see that at the nine o'clock position, if, if imagine it's a clock, that you see a healthy leaf. And uh, then as you progress around the spectrum, you see increasing degree of problems of bronzing and uh, necrosis occurring on that plant. That's what we see as the progression of iron and manganese toxicity. Take a tissue sample, you'll see that the levels of iron and manganese are probably about 3x higher than what the recommenda recommendation would be. And usually for my rule of thumb, in, it varies a little with crop, but about 5.4 is the cutoff. If you have a pH below 5.4, you kind of you do a pour through, you look at the pH, you pretty well know what's going on. And there's some some plants that can surprise you that are susceptible to low pH problems. Here's one that was surprising. We were at a grower two years ago, and, you know, we don't do much on streptocarpus, but when we looked at it, it was such bright purple, you know, the initial reaction was, wow, they need phosphorus. But, but then the plant had been growing. So with lack of phosphorus, you ought to have more compact plants. 
And then it was looking at the second cultivar and it was a little more of a blackish purple. And that's a typical symptom that we will see with low pH problems. In the case here, the pH was 5.4. Uh, we took a tissue analysis and ran those values and we did report that in EGRO 3.29. If you wanna look at that, go to the EGRO website and you can see that. Here's another classic one for down here in the south, and this is more of the, uh, the other type of, of problems it's, it being more of a blackening. Gerbera, lower foliage. So all of these low pH problems occur on the lower foliage of the plant, not the upper foliage. It's an accumulation of micronutrients that causes that blackening and then ultimately death of that leaf. That's what's going on with this plant here. Quite striking. Uh, you know, I, I keep on saying, you know, like uh, conditions are, are concerned down here in North Carolina, but, you know, there was a few years ago, a large greenhouse out of the Midwest uh, contacted me and they also had low pH problems on their Gerbera. So, you know, even if you're sitting in the middle of alkalinity in the Midwest, uh, you can still run into problems. So when we look at the pH over time, what happens? And so, the type of fertilizer that we use, either acidic, NH4s, ammoniacal type nitrogen, what does it do over time to the substrate pH? As you can see the graph there, it tends to make it go down. On the other end of the spectrum, if you use a nitrate type fertilizer, it's more basic, what's it do? It makes the pH go up. And so that's a basic principle that we work off of and that pretty well works as long as you have things in balance. And I'll explain that in, in a minute. So you can over, the take homes here are based on which fertilizer you pick, it will determine whether or not you increase the pH or lower the pH. And over time, you can see those uh, uh, changes occur. So how do we know if a, a fertilizer is basic or acidic? Well, it's, it is on the bag. Sometimes you really have to look for it. And you can see here that I circled and it's gonna be expressed as potential acidity or it's gonna be expressed as potential basicity. So it's only that change of the word and then the amount of equivalent in pounds of calcium carbonate per ton. So we just use that, that number as a relative source. So anything like a 201020, or in the case of this, this one here was a 2820, those are acidic. Uh, calcium nitrate-based fertilizer, all the CalMag fertilizers, those are basic fertilizers. They will tend to make the pH go up. So just by looking on the bag, potential acidity, basicity, will help you determine which way you're gonna start shifting things. Uh, and in the case of, if you have low alkalinity, this is gonna be the driving force of which way your pH goes in that substrate. So I do wanna point out though, this is some work that was done at um, NC State here. Uh, it was Dr. Nelson's grad student, Kei Young Jong, and she looked at running fertilizer type and what happened to the pH. And she used three fertilizers, a basic, 13 to 13, a neutral, 17, 5, 17, and then the acidic, 20, 10, 20. And over time, what happened to the pH when they were irrigating calanchos at 100 parts per million? So, of course, the the orange line, acidic, what do you expect to happen? It's an acidic fertilizer, the graph that was shown earlier, the pH goes down. You see that, that's, that's, that's what you expect. Now the neutral one, it did decrease a little, but it was below what you would expect for the basic one. The basic one was higher. So you know, the, both the basic and neutral did drop over time, but, but for the most part, they are higher than acidic fertilizer. And you can see that you can get that rate effect. So everything is good. But in this case, for the most part, the amount of nutrition that's needed at 100 part per million equaled what the plant needed also. So you were, you were within balance. That's what I'm, but that's the key take home that this, this graph gives you here. And, and what occurs here to explain it, that when you look at fertilizer uptake, and that's where we rely upon this potential basicity or potential acidity approach to guide us on what's gonna happen, that is an uptake occurrence with the root. And so the root wants to remain balanced. It wants to remain neutral. So when the fertilizer rate equals the plant needs rate, 
this is what happens. So if I add a, an ammoniacal fertilizer, if a positive goes in the root, a positive has to come off. So the positives are, are acidic. And so that uptake kicks out a positive charge, which is acidic, and that pH will fall. So, so using acidic fertilizer will drop your pH. That's what this is showing. On the other hand, if you're doing a nitrate-type fertilizer, it kicks out a negative OH. That negative helps increase the pH. So that's the basic running principles that we're looking at here on, on plant uptake when the fertilizer rate equals the need of the plant. So let's sh shift this now. Now, what have we changed here? Calanchos are now being fertilized at a higher rate, 200 parts per million N. And as we'd expect, look at that graph, that orange line, acidic fertilizer. It drops over time, but you know, that's what we said it's gonna do because it's acidic fertilizer and it's gonna drop it. But interesting enough, when they also measured the pH over time for the basic fertilizer and the neutral fertilizer, they also dropped the pH. So it's like, what's going on here? Because, I mean, what, what's supposed to happen? Is it, is it um, you said this is basic, it's supposed to increase the pH. And what's going on is the chemical effect of the fertilizer is far greater. And you have this overabundance that's still sitting there in the root system that overabundance is greater than what happens on the uptake on that root system of that plant. So that, that, that greater amount overwhelms it and, and all fertilizers are acidic. A basic 13 to 13 probably has a pH of about 4.0 when you measure it coming out of the hose. A calcium nitrate a dark weather feed is gonna be the same, but it's, so it's overall acidic you're adding it to it. If you add too much, that uptake of the roots doesn't overcome it. So we see the pH drop. That's why if you had, have been using some cow mags and you think it's gonna drop or increase the pH and it goes the other way, that's the reason why. And that was explained with the work that Kay Young Jung did uh, uh, under Dr. Nelson's uh, direction. So, under this case, just to illustrate this, the same principle when an ammoniacal in uh, H4 gets taken up, it kicks off a, a hydrogen plus, you get the OH minus with nitrates. So that happens, but that extra chemical effect of the fertilizer is much greater than what can happen with the acidic fertilizer. We expect that and the pH falls and the same principle happens with the basic fertilizer and the pH falls. So just to kind of illustrate that uh, again to make the point for what's happening. So it does, the principle of acidic and basic fertilizers does work as long as you have the fertility rate in balance. So to avoid this drop of pH, you need to make sure that you have a balanced approach that the fertilizer you apply equals the amount of fertilizer that you need. And then that acidic basic uptake mechanism will in fact work for you in the crops. Now, it's easier said than done when you have 100 crops or 1,000, 500 species growing in your greenhouse in the spring. So that one's a hard balance, uh, but you can kind of see what needs to go on there uh, that you probably ought to be, if you're relying upon that and uh, the, the fertilizer selection to be your guiding point on where your pH is going in your substrate, a lower fertilization rate, 100, 125 uh, part per million probably is what you need to target. So as another option, if you do have a low alkalinity, you can add buffering. You're basically kind of like trying to add your own limestone into the system and potassium bicarbonate can go in there. The rates are there, it's on the slide master and what people can do it. You will be bumping up, of course, your potassium levels. So you need to make sure you don't go too high and um, mess up your, uh, uh, get too high a levels that mess up your calcium or prevent calcium and magnesium uptake from occurring. That's how I should say it. So, okay. And, and this graphic here is just, you know, if you do have low alkalinity water, if you want to use an acidic fertilizer versus a neutral versus a basic fertilizer, first adjust the lime rate. So um, if you want to use an acidic fertilizer and low alkalinity, have more lime, lime added to the soil versus if you want to use the basic fertilizer, 
decreased a little. And then in all cases, balance the amount of nutrition. I've been saying that. And then basically until you get a system up and working that well for you, monitor, 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 just to make sure you're not having a drift going. Uh, low pH problem, children, geraniums, zinnias, dahlias, fuchsias, marigolds, uh, peppers, tomatoes, those are all good ones to keep your eye on, be, and Gerbera. Uh, they will, they'll be the first ones to indicate that they're not very happy, and that will ho hopefully help you in the process of figuring this out. So, I covered low alkalinity first. Now, probably the reason most of you are here is because you don't have low alkalinity. You got the opposite end of the spectrum. You have high alkalinity. And, you know, I grew up in the Midwest. I worked in Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, Iowa. Um, I, know, I know high alkalinity. Uh, probably my teeth are stronger because I grew up on high alkaline water. Uh, so uh, so this, this is really the point of the presentation to look at. So this is the principle where things kind of get uncertain, and that is, we need to be looking at the alkalinity. It, it is certainty. We need to look at the alkalinity. It's not the substrate, or it's not the water pH. So if you have a change in the substrate pH, it is moved by the alkalinity to, let's, let's say, a 10-factor greater influence than the pH of that water. The pH of that water only influences really the kind of the charges, if it's one charge or two charge on, charges available on that alkalinity species that's in there, the water. So it's all about the alkalinity. It, it's very little about the water pH. Because again, it's the dissolved limestone in the water is how we need to look at it. And if things start getting too high, what happens? The substrate pH goes up iron is tied up and you start seeing iron chlorosis, intervenal chlorosis of the upper or newer foliage, like that, that pretty geranium that's there. Here's some other ones. Here is a caladium. That one, that one really looks, I, I really like that photo, but you know, I would because I, I shoot so many dead plant photographs. And that euphorbia there, I mean, how can, how can a plant death type of guy not really like a photograph like that? I mean, I, I love it. And then here's some, here's some uh, poinsettias. So, you know, just got to, got to have the fall crops for the Christmas spirit. So you can see clearly the intervenal chlorosis and it's severe enough that you can see the next youngest leaves. Now they're a little further down in the canopy just because they haven't pushed up. They've already gone to severe case of what's going on and they're completely yellow. Uh, but again, it's the top growth under these conditions where we see iron chlorosis. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at these four factors here uh, through the process of this presentation and talk about what needs to go on. So we're going to start with the effects of alkalinity. So when you look at the substrate pH there on the y-axis over time, the x-axis, what happens based on different water types. So if I have high amount of alkalinity in the water and a high pH, what I say, it's like dissolved limestone in the water. What do you expect is going to happen? Well, yeah, it's going to shoot up. You see that there. But also, if you have high amount of alkalinity and a low pH, now, the probability of that happening is lower. 90% of the high alkalinity waters have high pHs. But the point is here, it's also going to go up. It's just not going to go up quite as much but it's still going to go up and cause a detrimental effect. So then if you have a low amount of alkalinity and a high pH, so in that case, think about it, there's almost no buffering in that water and it just happens to be acidic or, or a basic, it's not going to change the substrate pH over time because there's no, there's no dissolved limestone in that water to make that change occur. So it's going to stay kind of neutral, and then low alkalinity, low pH will stay low or, you know, but then again, I just went over low alkalinity situations. You add an acidic fertilizer to that, and we need to make the graph go down like pH 2 because it's going to shoot down like this. And so I, I, I saw the water about uh, 60 miles from here, had a pH of 4, 3, and like no alkalinity. I, I didn't know that type of water existed. And um, 
it was amazing. I, I, that scares me. I'd rather have a little alkalinity for security in there. So anyway, the take home here is it's all about the alkalinity. The pH plays a little part, but it's the alkalinity that drives the boat for what goes on. So here's another example. If I have grower A and the water pH is 9.3, but there's very little alkalinity at 1.42 milli equivalents versus grower B that has a lower pH. It's four or it's eight, three versus nine, three, but he has about four X the amount of alkalinity that's there. And so what's it going to take to neutralize that alkalinity to a target pH of five, eight? Well, it's only going to take about 20 ounces of acid for grower A, but for grower B because of that additional alkalinity that's there to get it that pH down that you have to add the acid to neutralize to take care of that dissolved limestone in that water and it's going to take 88 ounces it's going to take four times the amount of acid to get that to work to bring it down to that level so again it's the alkalinity not the pH that you need to be concerned about now alkalinity values for you are going to vary by your your well location, well depth, and time of the year. So if you have more than one well, uh, they could vary, especially if you went down to different aquifers. If you're using surface water, you're gonna have very little alkalinity there. And there, you know, so depth matters, uh, the location matters, and there's some usually some variation in the year. A dry summer, the aquifer drops. It seems to consolidate or condense down the concentration of the, the dissolved particles, and, and many times you'll see an increased bump up in the summer, but I've also seen it go the other way. So it's going to vary, vary by your location. So you need to test it, and until you get a good handle, then, then you know, after, you might do it quarterly, and then after, after you know where things are at, then you can slow it down to, to like before you start your spring season and before you start your fall season. So here's some water. These are samples actually we took when I was at Iowa State, and you can see grower A pretty well keeps about eight milli equivalents of alkalinity, one milli equivalent in bicarbonate, you'd, you'd multiply that by 61, so you're getting about 480 parts per million of bicarbonate. So um, that's high. You can see the next person had a drop going in the summer. Like I said, some can go up and then some can go down. And the last person, it was pretty well low and then went up. So it can change. So until you test, you don't know how much change that's happening so you need to do that and we'll talk about how you test in a minute so what is alkalinity it's the measures of the water's capacity to neutralize acid and it's mainly expressed in in bicarbonate but it might be expressed in the carbonate ion and so the the big difference between those two is the valence if you notice the bicarbonate has one negative sign and the carbonate ion has two and if you got two val uh, two negatives you gotta you gotta get something attached to two points so it takes more is how how you kind of need to look at it so this illustrates the type of um species of alkalinity that might be present uh and so the bottom x-axis has the ph so you know we're pretty well if you have high alkalinity you're really between um pH seven and eight on your water for the most part. If you start, if you look at, you start get, getting above nine, that line starts going up. That is the two, two valent species the, uh, that occurs. And so for the most part, we're looking at the, the, the valence of negative one, the bicarbonate. And so as you see that the pH goes down when it gets more acidic, when you're getting down into the four, five, and six range, basically things are getting neutralized and it's no longer available. So a case in point here, if you're ever trying to do an acid water fix for a crop, and I have that red box around four, you can see that you don't get any more bang for your buck uh, after you get down to about pH four. So, you know, neutralizing uh, that uh, making an acid water application of, of around 4.5 is probably about as low as you want to go. Uh, you won't get any more additional effect any further than that. So when you look at alkalinity, it's either reported as by part per million or milli equivalent, and it can be 
express in a calcium carbonate equivalent or a bicarbonate equivalent. And there are the conversion factors. One milli equivalent of, of calcium carbonate is 50 parts per million of calcium carbonate, or one milli equivalent equals 61 parts per million bicarbonate. So if we went to milli equivalents, it's universal, and then you can convert the other way. Lab test reports are not always clear. I actually happened to look at one last night from Indiana, and it said alkalinity, and I didn't know what it was. And luckily, there was a second report that I looked at, and they expressed it in bicarbonate. So I knew, knew what I was looking at because um, it can make an error factor when you're doing your recommendation. So always, you might have to ask your, the lab where you, if you get an external water test done what they're reporting the alkalinity and what kind of units, and then go from there. So when you're looking at sources of alkalinity, by far it's bicarbonates. It can be calcium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate. Usually it's calcium uh, bicarbonate. If you do a complete water test, it's going to give you, you know, you're going to see that there's calcium in the water, magnesium in the water, or sodium in the water, and that's going to give you a relative idea of what species your bicarbonate's in. And so that, that just gives you the background. And it could be just basically a carbonic ions, but you know, based on that, that, that whirlwind figure a few uh, slides back, you're gonna have to start getting above a pH of about nine before that really becomes uh, the species that's common for what's going on. And then in the bottom, there's, there's a number of minor contributors that could be there. Um, so they're not going to be much. And you'd see that in the water test if they, if they were true. And those ions would be have to be high for them to be players in, in this. So let's look then at how alkalinity increases the substrate pH. So here's my root again. And so I have some bicarbonate. And then if the bicarbonates then it neutralizes it, the negative neutralizes the positive, so the hydrogen ion, and together they form the neutral carbonic acid, and you get CO2 in water. So it, it basically neutralizes it and takes it out of, out of the situation. If it's carbonate, there's two charges there. So what's that mean? It means it's got to have two hydrogens come there. And guess what? It does the same thing. You get, you get more water and CO2. But, you know, that alkalinity will neutralize any acidity that's in that substrate. And so once it overwhelms that and there's plenty of then negative charges still there, that's when you start seeing the pH going up at the plant. So acidity is picked up and changed the water. And if it's not there to counteract it, the basicity is going to win and the, su the substrate's going to increase. So let's look at assessment. So I cut this down to one slide, and that is you can, you can do in-house testing. That Hanner checker there, it's about $49, and it will do about 25 tests for you. So it's a color metric one. Uh, you'd also then independently want to check the water pH and the EC, or you can send a water sample in to a, a testing lab and get it done. And so that, that, that works pretty well. That it, I would suggest you go to a commercial lab first, and then you know all the other water parameters that might be there. And then you can go back and do this over time to see how your alkalinity might vary. So very easy. It's color metric. It pops up. Uh, you put a vial in there with water. The instructions are easy. And if you go on online, there's there's even videos out there that, to watch if you have nothing else to do. But it there it, it's it's easy to use. I mean, even a professor can use it. So if I can, everyone else can, right? Is that how it goes? So no comments on that one. Don't, no questions. Okay. So alrighty then then corrections. This is a little more of, of what's going on here. So. When we look at levels, we classify after you get your test results back if it's, in, and this is in milli equivalent, so if you want it expressed in parts per million bicarbonate, you would measure that equivalent, uh, that milli equivalent value and uh, multiply it by 61. So you're looking at about 100 parts per million bicarbonate, 1.5 times 60, that's six, or 61 plus another 30. So it's about 90 parts per million bicarbonate for the upper one. So if it's low, you're good, you can live with it. 
The marginal when you when you get start getting a, above four milli equivalents, which again is probably about it's it's two hundred and forty parts per million bicarbonate you're going to start needing to do something. And it definitely, if you're above the four milli equivalent range, you need to take care of it. Otherwise, you're always going to be fighting the pH going up and you're going to have intravenal chlorosis. So here's some parameters of what to target. And notice that the lower range is all about 0.75 milli equivalents. Now, uh, 75 times 6, that's about 50 parts per million bicarbonate that you're looking at. Probably for, that. that's pretty good. I wouldn't go any lower. I like seeing a little alkalinity stay in the water because it keeps some buffering there so your pH doesn't go any further down because low pH problems are more problematic than upper pH problems. And then, then you have upper maxes. And what do you see that's going on there? As the pot size increases, the amount that's acceptable increases. So that goes back that, that there's more volume there uh, that helps offset some of that. You can live with a little more, but you can't live with a lot with a plug or seedling because you know that volume of soil is so small. So you have to do something about levels that start going over that maximum rate that's there. So for the most part, when I'm making recommendations, this is what I'm looking at. Uh, plugs around one milli equivalent, so that's about 61 part per million bicarbonate or 80 part per million of what you're looking at. And once you add acid or do whatever you're doing, your pH ought to be about 4.7. For a pot, because there's more substrate there, I like to sh shoot for about two milli equivalents of alkalinity or, or roughly an endpoint pH of 6.2. Now, that doesn't always work. Um, if you don't have quite as high of a pH value going in in the water, um, you if you're going to target a, a pH 6.2, you're not going to take care of enough alkalinity. So you're going to have to drop that down a little and play around with that. But that's the basic principles that we would use for doing that. So if you have higher than these levels, you need to do something about it. That's what it comes down to because you're going you're gonna to have to manage it in one way or the other, or you're going to see high pH problems going on with this plant. So there are some slight variances out there that some plants can take high pH situations and others can't. So some of these recommendations are going to vary slightly. So what, what's our classical plants that don't like high pH? Pansies, petunias. So you're going to have to neutralize more alkalinity for them uh, to make them happy than you would for something like a pepper uh, that can take a little higher pH. So that's kind of the, the, the balancing act that we have to play because we have so many different crops in the greenhouse. So ways to do this is blending with pond water, acidic fertilizers, and acid injection. So we'll talk each one of these. For pond water, the simple process is if you got pond water with a pH 6.8 and has very low alkalinity at 0.2, and you blend it with the uh, groundwater, basically you're gonna make an average for what's going on and you can live with that. So I'm not covering anything about the pathogen issue that goes on. Uh, the Florida group is excellent on that, that type of background information on their website. But the, the principle is to blend to get rid of some of the problems if you have that water source in fact available to you. The same thing goes that if you're using uh, reverse osmosis water doing the blend, uh, that can be done to help overcome the same situation and, and get the same thing going on. Uh, you do have to deal with the disposal of the salts, though, but you can overcome that. And maybe that's more of an issue that you want to do this option if you're having problems with the pH going up on plugs, which is high value and you need less water. This might be an option to end up considering. The other option that's used quite a bit, and, and that's part of the reason why, uh, besides the lower price of, of the fertilizer like 201020 is used, is that it's an acidic fertilizer. And so you can use that to neutralize up to about three milli equivalents of alkalinity. And again, that's three above your target. So if I'm have a target of one, you can, if you have four, you can neutralize some of that down uh, to get it down to that one for a plug, or you can neutralize it down to two milli equivalents remaining for pot plants. And so that can be done. Um, everything has its pluses that goes along with its negatives at the same time. You might not like all that 
ammoniacal nitrogen. And the further north you get during the winter time when it's cold, you can run into ammoniacal nitrogen toxicity. So you need to play with that. And then the other thing, and you know, and Josh Henry spoke yesterday on um, phosphorus rates. You know, if you get any high enough rate of, of fertilizer being added to overcome that, like for instance, that three milli equivalence alkalinity, you are oh you're applying um, excessive amounts of phosphorus, far and above, like 40 parts per million, where the threshold really is down to about 10 is all you need. And so you, there's that balancing act. So, so I always try, while this is an option, it's not my preferred option of what we would look at if you, you and so that, that, that will bring us into the next topic in a minute, but just, you know, acidic conditions, yellowing, some lower leaf, um, yellowing going on, light green that you can have with ammoniacal and the toxicity. And, and with, with a basic or acid fertilizer, we talked about this earlier, you just got to look there in the label. Now, it's kind of hidden on some of them, so you got to look. And again, there's, there's one or two words, potential acidity or potential basicity. It's acidity, basicity is what you're looking at because that's the only words they're going to change in that sentence other than the number to tell you which way it's going to take your pH um, by using it. So what's the principle with the fertilizer? So you, you want to have a root remain balanced. That's a root in the middle. So you add an ammoniacal type fertilizer. It kicks off a uh, hydrogen. And so the pH falls. And so how does the acidic fertilizer then work off of this to neutralize the alkalinity? It basically, you're throwing out additional hydrogen ions, it attaches to the bicarbonate. And so then you're going through the process of neutralizing it. So the plant will turn into carbonic acid and then ultimately CO2 and water when it disassociates. So you're picking up the alkalinity because of that acidity that you added and neutralizing it. So by far my preferred choice here is looking at acid injection. That gives you the management you need, and you might it might take twin hit injections. That's what a lot of smaller greenhouses use in the Midwest. One one dosatrine for acid, one for fertilizer, and so you you add the amount of acid needed to get down to your target level. So my philosophy has been, especially when there's high levels of alkalinity, that you neutralize it first with an acid, then you set your fertilizer strategy. Because um, then, uh, otherwise, you're locked into a, a highly acidic fertilizer that gives you a lot of ammoniacal nitrogen, then phosphorus, and you're then flushing up growth. Then you're going to have to change some other parameters going on. Let's start. Let, let's get the real culprit controlled. That's why I try to focus on acid injection first. So, by far, the acids that we're using that we're looking at, sulfuric is the choice. 93% if you're a bigger operation, but 35% battery acid from auto zone is what a lot of smaller growers use. Most people aren't using much phosphoric because it adds too much phosphorus to the system. High phosphorus levels through phosphorus uh, um, acid injection has been reported to cause distortion on poinsettia leaves during propagation. Uh, for plugs, citric acid works. Usually the cost is going to be higher than sulfuric acid, but it's the safest alternative and plug producers are tending to do that. And then nitric acid can be used, but it's, it's the most caustic of those to both you and the pipes. Now, there are some growers that want to go with a calcium nitrate, potassium nitrate mixture, and they will they initially add some phosphoric acid to give them a, a low dose of phosphorus that they want, and then they finish off neutralizing the remaining alkalinity with a sulfuric acid. And you can do that as a two-step process by, by using the alkalinity calculator we're going to talk about in a minute. Just plug in the first values, bring it down, replug in those endpoint values, and then get it down to where you finally want it to be. So safety again, citric is safe. Um, it's like adding orange juice to your plants, not quite, but you know, it's pretty safe. Phosphoric is the next, uh, but it's still, an, it's a nice acid that will do a number to you if you're not wearing protective equipment. Sulfuric's a little, little more strong and then nitric's the uh, stronger, strongest. So 
treat it with respect. It is an acid when you add it. And always remember, what do you do? Do you add acid to water or water to acid? It's always, you put the water in first, you add some acid there. If you do it the other way around, it can splatter up and acid in your face is not what you wanna have uh, for what's going on there. So all those nutrients or all those acids if you're using sulfuric acid, it's gonna give you some sulfur that, for the plant. So they're all fertilizer sources when you look at it. So you might need to do some adjustments to your fertility, but for the most part, I don't think you're gonna be really adding that much, uh, except for um, if you go to nitrate, you might get up to maybe 20 parts per million, 20 parts per million N, which is really not much that you need to be concerned about. And then if, how do you know how much to add? It, basically what I'm saying here is your water's different. You have a different alkalinity, you have a different pH, so you need to customize what's going on. We, we put the, the alkalinity calculator up at the University of New Hampshire site when Brian Krug was there. We have not taken it down. Uh, you might have a little hard time to find it, but if you use that, that well, you could Google search, it does work. It, it worked for me last night because I had a typo in the handout and look in that, that um, um, web address. See the A is, is, is red. Uh, autocorrect kicked it up to a, um, um, a capital A and it would not find the calculator. So I had to go down to a little A and that's, that's your rate. So you, if you go there, you plug in your values, your set points, and you can put your alkalinity in and in milli equivalents by car of bicarbonate part per million calcium carbonate equivalent, and then set your endpoint of where you want to bring it down. We said for plugs about one milli equivalent of alkalinity is your target. And for potted plants or bigger plants, it's two milli equivalents. And you have to pick your acid. If, uh, usually battery acid's the one of choice, but there's other choices that you can pick and end up using and get it calculated. You can print off a copy, put it in your file, and then again, Alkalinity does change over time, so you need to test, and then you can make adjustments to that water, how much acid you're adding to overcome that alkalinity. So by far, we've made it fairly simple for it to be calculated, and then you can get a customized report for your water source that you have. And then finally, let's go over recommendations. So I said the endpoints already plugs, one milli equivalent, it's going to roughly be about 5.7 pots, two milli equivalents of alkalinity. Again, that's uh, 122 part per million uh, of bicarbonate. And that's that seems to work pretty well over the years of working with growers in the Midwest. Um, that that at leaving that little residual there was a great insurance policy from keeping the pH going from dropping too low. So if you're higher than that level, you need to do something about it. And so that's where we're talking about acid injection. So you need to neutralize it and then also monitor the endpoint pH in the pH that's in your soil. With, and you can use the pour through method, one to two SME, just to make sure your pH is on track. Now, when you start injecting acid at the beginning, there's usually some residual that's built up in the pipes. It might take two weeks to get you finally to get down to a low enough level. You're gonna have to basically neutralize any of that crud that's in that pot or that in that 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 water line and so you might need to, to, to kind of keep an eye on that but it it should clear out within about a month for what's going on and so under the worst conditions when you're trying to get rid of this alkalinity and, and taking out uh, between between two and six milli equivalents you could go in with an acidic fertilizer to try to tackle two part per, or two milli equivalents you could then potentially attack um, another milli equivalent with phosphoric acid if you have it for no other source, but you're probably going to get it in your acidic fertilizer, so you don't want to do that. And you already have, that would give you 28 part per million phosphorus, and that's more than enough. And so if you don't need that phosphorus, you can skip the second step and just go to a sulfuric or nitric acid. That's really what people are doing, and then monitor it to make sure you're right. Because a, a side story is I was working with the grower and I did this before the calculator got got developed. And I 
I calculated how much you needed for a gallon, and then I asked the person, how much is your concentrate tank? And they said 30 gallons, so I multiplied that amount by 30, gave it to them, and about six months later, they call me and say, we're having problems with geraniums, they're not rooting. And the pH is like 3.8, and it's like, holy Toledo, what I do to these people? And so I go back through my math, my math's right. And then finally I said, well, and then I got the rate there, we did it for 30 gallons, and then they go, oh, we looked, it's a 20 gallon container. So we were adding one and a half times the amount of acid because there was the mistake on, was it a 30 gallon or 20 gallon? So you got to monitor it to make sure you don't mess up. It's too valuable for crops. So any, anyway, something to keep in mind there. So getting towards the end, again, my point is that it's the water alkalinity is what has the greatest impact on substrate pH, not the pH of the water. And so if you have a low substrate situation, there's not much buffering that's there. Your fertilizer type, you pick basic or acidic, is really gonna influence which way your pH goes over time. So that's how, what you need to play with. It's better to be slightly higher than it is lower. So in the case down here, I love using 13 to 13 Cal Mag to get what I need. High alkalinity areas, do a test to see what's going on and then your target levels are one milli equivalent for plugs, two for larger containers. And if it's not there, you gotta do something. Blend with other water sources, use an acidic fertilizer for small amounts of neutralization like two milli equivalents, or just go ahead and do it and do the acid injection. And then that opens up to, you can use whatever fertilizer you want and not supply too much ammoniacal nitrogen or phosphorus. So. So with that, I wanna thank the overall research supporters that support us here at NC State University, Doom and Orange, fine, proven winners. We've been working with tobacco lately. Jo that, Josh is the tobacco king. Uh, we call him Bubba down here. And Old Castle, also SunGrow, the Floriculture American Floral Endowment, and HRI, and of course, the Fred C. Klockner Foundation. And in particular for this, this webinar, we would like to thank Old Castle for their support of the NC State program. So with that, that is the end of the presentation. So um, hopefully that gave you an, uh, some background information that's helpful.